All right, Vika, how much longer do we want to wait for people to show up? I think we have a big crowd, so we can definitely start. Joel, do you want to make sure that you can share the slides before I introduce you? Uh, sure. So let's see. Uh, share screen. And here it is. Okay, perfect. Perfect. Awesome. Great. Uh, so our speaker today is Joel David Hankins, who really never needs an introduction, which we can see by <laughs> the number of people attending the talk today. And Joel is at the University of Oxford, but of course, for most of his career, he was at CUNY, so he's really coming back home today. And Joel is one of the original founders, in fact, of the seminar. I think the main founder, it was our graduate study group before it officially became a seminar back when I was in grad school. So Joel is going to talk today about categorical cardinals. Go ahead. Well, thank you so much for the introduction. It's so great to be back at CUNY after uh, being away here. Uh, so the, the CUNY set their seminar. Okay, I'm gonna talk about categorical cardinals and this is joint work with Robin Solberg who is here, uh, if you look for him uh, in the crowd there. And uh, he and I were working on these uh, categorical cardinals. So let me just start and I just threw these slides together quickly because this is work in progress. Um, and so you'll have to excuse me if there's any typos or anything on them. But I wanna begin just by talking generally about categoricity. So a theory is categorical uh, if it identifies a unique mathematical structure up to isomorphism. So in other words, any two models of the theory uh, are isomorphic. And of course, uh, for infinite structures, that's impossible if your theory is a first order theory because of the levenheim skolem theorem, because you all, you'll always have models of arbitrarily large cardinality by the upward levenheim skolem theorem for a first order theory. And so categoricity is generally um, talked about in connection with second order theories. And most of our fundamental structures in mathematics have these kind of categorical descriptions in second order um, logic. So for example, the natural numbers were um, uh, have a categoricity result due to Dedekind. So if I have the natural numbers with zero and successor, so not in the PA language, but in the Dedekind arithmetic language where you have only zero and successor in the language. Um, so the theory is that, uh, well, first of all, um, zero is not, this is a unary function and zero is not the successor of anything and the successor function is one to one. And then the, the second order induction axiom, which says that if you have any subset of the domain which contains zero and which is closed under successor, then it uh, contains everything. Um, and Dedekind proves that that uniquely characterizes the standard model. Um, and so that theory that I just described is a categorical theory. Uh, and this model is the model that's categorically characterized by it. Okay, but we have, of course, all kinds of other uh, categoricity results, the real numbers. The real field is the unique, complete ordered field. Of course, to be an ordered field is a first order theory, but to be complete, meaning that the order is complete, of course, the order is definable, I mean, if it's an ordered field, uh, but the completeness axiom is a second order axiom saying that every, every cut is filled. Um, and the real, the real field is the unique, complete ordered field. For a long time, I wasn't sure who this was due to, and I really had to track it down. Eventually, I asked a math overflow question. I thought maybe it was Hilbert and so on, because he had a he had an axiomatization of the real field um, that was, in fact, categorical, but I couldn't find him stating the categoricity or the categoricity result. And then finally, it seems to be due to Huntington in 1903, who also is the person who introduced the, the term categorical in that paper. Okay, uh, the complex field is the unique algebraically closed field of characteristic zero having size continuum. And that's a categorical characterization of the complex field. Also, you could say the complex field is the unique algebraic closure of the real field. And that's a different categorical characterization. So we have these categorical characterizations of many of our fundamental mathematical structures. Okay, in set theory, we have uh, what's called quasi-categoricity. So if we think about the second order ZF set theory, so this is, this is just like the first order theory, except now we have second order separation and replacement axioms. So, so we assert it not in the Henkin, so I'm not talking about 
second order set theory in the sense of Gerdel Bernays or Kelly Morris. I'm talking about full second order semantics. Um, and so I state the separation and replacement axioms where I'm allowed to quantify over all subsets of sets that I have and all um, uh, functions on a given domain and so on. Um, so I state those separation and replacement axioms in that second order way. Um, and then Zermelo proved that if you have a model of that second order Zermelo theory, um, then, well, first of all, it has to be well-founded because if it were ill-founded, there would be an omega sequence, a descending omega sequence, an epsilon descending omega sequence, and that with the second order resources would enable you to see that. Um, and so it must be well-founded. So we might as well be using the real epsilon relation, I mean, up to isomorphism. If it's well-founded, it's gonna be isomorphic to a transitive uh, set. And then secondly, it must be correct about power sets because of the second order separation axiom. If you have a set, then every subset exists uh, there uh, by that second order separation axiom, and therefore M will compute power sets correctly. And from that, it follows that when you do the internal cumulative hierarchy inside M, it's gonna be correct. And therefore M is gonna end up being some V alpha set because of that. Um, and, and then the height, the alpha, the height of that model must be regular by the second order replacement axiom. And so the ultimate conclusion is that M has to be a rank initial segment V kappa for some inaccessible cardinal V kappa, because kappa will be close under power set and will be regular by what we set. So, okay. And conversely, all models like that are models of the second order zermelo Frankel set theory. And so another way of saying it is that uh, the models of second order set theory are exactly the V kappas where kappa is an inaccessible cardinal. And this isn't quite a categoricity result because we might have a lot of different inaccessible cardinals. And, uh, um, but it's what's called a quasi-categoricity result. And one of the important conclusions, oh, I'm sorry. Okay, so these are now known as the Grothendieck zermelo universes or the category theorists usually just call them Grothendieck <coughs> universes, but Grothendieck's use of them was really a rediscovery of the Zermelo 1930 analysis where he was already looking at them as universes. And so uh, one should really uh, call them growth index Zermelo universes. Um, okay. Zermelo was aware of the, the Zermelo was aware of the, uh, the uh, potential difference between uh, internal and external well-foundedness. I didn't realize that, but he, he must have been given. Well, he must he have said. been in order to have, uh, I mean, uh, I think he has to have been in order to approve the theorem. So. Yeah. Well, unless he's, I mean, is he really, he's, he's working with general models, he's not. I mean, of course, Zermelo's else. original axiomatization of set theory, the original Zermelo axioms were not what we call today the Zermelo theory because Zermelo had proposed them as basically second order axioms from the start. And it was really only the first order conception of Z and CF that won out eventually because, um, because people objected to uh, well, what does it mean? You know, where are you interpreting these second order quantifiers and so on? And people didn't find it necessarily uh, as coherent as, as the way we think about ZF now as a first order, as a strictly first order theory. Um, but this was 1930. And so that was after the first order version of ZF had sort of uh, become settled. Um, but I guess he's still concerned here with the second order version. And so, yeah. Okay, then, then they had non standard models of arithmetic by then, I suppose. So. By 1930. Well, uh, I guess they did, but it, it, things were really kind of unclear. Yeah. I think. But I mean, I mean, unless, I mean, if you don't at least have non-standard models of arithmetic, non-standard omega, then it's not even clear that you realize there's a an issue there. Of right. uh, I mean, Scholem had quite a lot to say about that, but yeah. this is the second order theory, so it really is standard, and and Zermelo, I think, argued that. So it follows now from this theorem that I mean another. A consequence is that if you have two models of this theory, then one of them is isomorphic to a rank initial segment of the other, because they're both these V kappa, so one of them is taller, or they're also the same. And so it's not quite categoricity, it's quasi-categoricity. Okay, so the project that Robin and I set ourselves was to investigate when, when do we get actual categoricity, full categoricity from this quasi-categoricity, if we strengthen the theory, then in many cases we can we can get full categoricity uh, for the theory. So which models of the second order ZF 
uh, satisfy fully categorical theories, many of them do. Um, and uh, so in many instances, we can just say add a single sentence and get a categorical theory that way, I mean, fully categorical. Um, so meaning that it's true in exactly one of those V kappas. So this part of the theory here, the ZF2, is gonna make sure that it's a V kappa where kappa is inaccessible. And so really what we're talking about are models of uh, the, the, the rank initial segments of the universe cut off at an inaccessible cardinal. And what additional statement can you make about that V kappa that will completely pin it down in comparison with all the other such uh, initial segments? So for example, it could say that there is no, it could say there no rank initial segment of me is a ZF2. Exactly, like exactly. Or just more simply, there's no inaccessible cardinal. Right, right. Yeah. yeah. And so that's going to be one of the examples. Okay. So, right. Sometimes we have to add a whole theory, not just the sentence. Sometimes we have to add a second order sentence. Sometimes we have to add a second order theory. So these are the kind of things we're interested in. And Gunter, it's very good to see you. So that's you. Wait, sorry, Joel. Can I just ask one question? Sure. So you you've written ZF two everywhere, and there's no mention of the axiom of choice. Presumably, the axiom of choice could hold or fail depending on what happens in V. Yeah. Let's see. Uh, you know, you're absolutely right. I wrote ZF two, but I'm thinking in my mind ZFC two all the time. The the cat the quasi categoricity result doesn't need choice, but uh, if you don't have choice, then actually defining what you mean by inaccessible cardinal is slightly fussy. Um, and so uh, I'm just going to assume the axiom of choice everywhere except where it's not needed, but that will be unmentioned, <laughs> if you don't mind. Um, so uh, I think I'm writing ZF2 everywhere, but really uh, I probably should have written ZFC because I didn't really think too much about it. Okay, thank you. Okay, so um, okay, so this is the point that that Gunter had just mentioned, namely that if you have the least inaccessible cardinal, then of course v kappa is characterized by the theory of ZF uh, ZF two plus there are no inaccessible cardinals, or in other words, there's no initial segment of me that satisfies ZF two. Um, the least one is the only one that doesn't have any inaccessible cardinals below it, and so of course that completely determines that model. This part makes it an inaccessible, and this part makes it the least inaccessible. Okay, so therefore, the first, uh, the least inaccessible cardinal is first order sententially categorical. I'm going to give formal definitions of that. Okay, but of course, we could also define the next one because that, the next one is the only one that thinks there's exactly one inaccessible cardinal, and so on, or exactly two, and so on. You can go on quite a long way. Uh, just by counting the number of inaccessible cardinals. Okay, so the main definition now, kappa is first order of sententially categorical if you can do it with a sentence. So in other words, uh, if there's a first order sentence sigma such that V kappa is categorically characterized by this theory. So another way of saying that is that kappa is the only inaccessible cardinal such that V kappa satisfies sigma. Okay, first order theory categorical is just the same, except now we allow ourselves to state a whole first order theory. And you can think of this as a, as a kind of Leibnizian notion. I mean, it's about discernibility because kappa is theory categorical just means that um, for any other candidate V lambda, there's some sentence that's true in V kappa that isn't true in V lambda. So we can discern V kappa from any other V lambda by some first order sentence, because it's part of the theory that that sentence is true here, but V lambda doesn't have the same theory. And so there's some sentence that they disagree about. Okay, then we have the second order version. Second order sententially categorical means I add a second order sentence, or a second order theory categorical means I add a second order theory. And of course, there's a whole very fine stratification of this so we can talk about sigma m n categoricity or sigma alpha n if we go sort of transfinite levels. So not only second order, but third order, fourth order, alpha order for any alpha, we can make sense of this. Um, uh, Joel, Joel, sure. Sorry. So is it clear that three is weaker than two? So it's not I'm going to talk about it. No. Okay. It's not okay. clear. They're they're incompatible. I mean, they're incomparable. It's it's going to come up in the implication diagram section. All right, thanks. 
Okay. So yeah, that's one of the results we have is figuring out exactly. Right, it's a very natural question and I didn't know the answer at first, namely what's better to have a first order theory or a second order sentence? And it's not clear if you should have implication in one way or the other, and in fact, you do not. Okay, well, because of the quasi-categoricity result, I mean, the inaccessible cardinals are exactly the models of ZFC2. Oh, here I have the C here. So uh, we can say that cap is first order sententially categorical. Instead of talking about categorical theories, I can just say, look, there's a sentence sigma so that cap is the only inaccessible cardinal that satisfies, such that B cap satisfies that sentence. Um, so we're really talking about inaccessible cardinals and we're talking about distinguishing the V kappas by their theories, either their first order theories or their second order theories, so sometimes by a single sentence, sometimes by a whole collection of sentences. Okay, so we've already said, as Gunther remarked, the least inaccessible is characterized by the assertion there is no inaccessible. And the next one is characterized by the assertion there's exactly one and then exactly two and so on. The alpha, of course, if we start with zero, is characterized by there are exactly alpha many. Um, and that is expressible provided that alpha is sufficiently absolutely definable. So once alpha gets very big, then you can't even say what does it mean to say to have the alpha one and is, is, is the definition of alpha absolute between these different V kappas and so on. But in the case when alpha is absolutely expressible, then the alpha one will definitely be uh, categorical. Okay, so we, have, we get quite a few inaccessible cardinals from the bottom. They're gonna be all categorical for quite a long way. So definitely at least up to the, um, the church cleany ordinal uh, and, and well beyond that. Okay. But also the omega one inaccessible cardinal, because omega one is an ordinal whose definition is absolute between all these v kappas, and so that one, if if it exists, is going to be categorical, and the omega second one, and so on. So if there's a proper class of inaccessible cardinals, which is a kind of working background assumption for looking into these categorical cardinals, then we're going to have quite a lot of uh, of of categorical cardinals. Um, and this is already leading you to the idea that there will be gaps in the categorical cardinals because there can't be that many sententially categorical cardinals. So there must be some smaller, like some countable uh, inaccessible cardinal that's not sententially categorical, even though the omega one one is because there's only countably many sentences and so only countably many of them can have a categorical sentential characterization. Okay, uh, so the omega alpha one is categorical if alpha is sufficiently describable in an absolute way. And then uh, we open the door to these gaps in the, in the categorical cardinals. Okay, good. Um, so I wanna point out that categoricity is really an anti-large cardinal notion. I mean, we defined categorical cardinal, which is of course an a kind of inaccessible cardinal and therefore it's automatically, I suppose, a large cardinal notion, except that we've also observed that it tends to be the small ones that are categorical and the larger ones are non-categorical. So in a sense, having non-categorical large cardinals is a larger large cardinal notion than having a categorical one. So yeah, that's like a failure of reflection in a way you could think about it. Exactly, that way, right? exactly, right. That's exactly right. And I'm gonna talk more about that very issue in the philosophical points at the end. Okay, so, so the smallest ones are categorical and the largest ones are not. Okay, let's just make some easy observations. I'm sorry, a lot of the observations in this talk are gonna be very easy actually. So I hope that everything goes smoothly. Uh, Okay, categoricity is down. Sorry, Joel. Sorry, Joel. Sure. Can I? Oh, you said that there are a lot of cardinals that are non-categorical that are small. No, the, if they're if the the small ones are always categorical, like the least <laughs> one is always the next one, and the next one, and so on for quite a long way. So categoricity tend seems to be something about the small ones. But and did you say that? that that there still have to be some like countable inaccessible cardinals or something that are non-categorical because there's only countably many sentences. Yes, exactly. That's true. Yeah. So, okay. 
So they sort of get thinner as you go up, right? And then okay. eventually, you know, you run out, even if you have a lot of inaccessibles. So, so eventually, from some point on, they're all non-categorical if you have them. Oh. Okay, categoricity is downward absolute from V to any V theta, because look, if, if kappa is categorical, that means that V kappa satisfies a sentence or a theory that only it satisfies. And so V theta can observe that V kappa satisfies that sentence. And V theta will think also that it's the only one because it really is the only one even outside of V theta. So therefore it's also the only one inside. V theta. So that gets you downward absoluteness. Um, oh, here, I have the proof here, okay. So V theta can verify that V kappa has the theory that it does have. And there are just fewer challenges to categoricity inside V theta than there are in V because in V to be categorical means you also have to win against all those V lambdas where lambda is bigger than theta, but to be categorical inside V theta, you only have to do it up in theta. Okay, so uh, it doesn't generally go the other way though. I mean, you can get violations. Um, okay, let us let me introduce this boldface plus, which means not the successor cardinal, but the successor inaccessible. So kappa boldface plus means the next inaccessible above kappa. Um, so, okay, if you have a second order sententially categorical cardinal, then the next inaccessible cardinal is first order sententially categorical because, uh, well, can anyone prove it? It's the least one that is above whatever other sentence is true about kappa. Uh, yeah, you don't have to say least though even. It's, it's, the, it's the only one that thinks there's a largest inaccessible cardinal kappa that satisfies a certain property. So if, if C is the characterization of V kappa, then, uh, then, then v, the v kappa plus, I mean the bold phase plus here, thinks there's a largest inaccessible cardinal and it satisfies C. And V kappa plus will be the only one like that. Because once you go higher, then it's gonna be a different largest one and it won't satisfy C precisely because C is the characterization of V kappa. Okay, oh, and so the point- You're using here that you can, you can describe the second order syntax in a first order way or something? Yeah, the sec a second order assertion about a V alpha inside some big, uh, v theta is a first order assertion in V theta because V theta has the full power set of that V alpha. Right. So second order, so it would work even for arbitrary order, even if I was saying not just second order, but you know, omega order or whatever, or alpha order for any alpha less than kappa plus, it would still work fine. So any amount of even very high order sentential categoricity means the next cardinal is gonna be first order and very low complexity first order sententially category. Okay, so if this is the, that was the successor case, here's the limit case. If kappa is inaccessible uh, and, and the sententially categorical cardinals are unbounded in the inaccessible cardinals below kappa, then kappa is first order theory categorical. So if you have a whole bunch of sententially categorical ones and you get above them and take the, the first inaccessible above that, it doesn't have to be the soup, right? So kappa might not be a limit of inaccessible, like the omega inaccessible is not the soup of the first omega many inaccessibles because the soup of the first omega many inaccessibles ha has cofinality omega, of course. Uh, so it couldn't be inaccessible, but maybe there's some next inaccessible above, right? So if you have a bunch of sententially categorical cardinals, then the next one above them all is going to be theory categorical um, because that theory can see that those smaller cardinals um, exist and they're categorical. So those cardinals are the only ones satisfying those sentences. So all of those things are part of the theory of V kappa. And also V kappa can see that there's no um, so it can't have any inaccessible below it with the same theory because that one below it would be would be missing some of those sententially categorical cardinals. So the theories would be different. Um, and, and no larger theta can have the same theory because in V theta, 
either there are going to be new sententially categorical cardinals that aren't realized in V-kappa, or, um, uh, or else the sententially categorical cardinals will not be unbounded in the inaccessibles because, because, kappa, because they were unbounded in kappa, and if you didn't get any new ones, then, uh, th then, um, then kappa itself won't be, uh, I mean, th then, then it won't be unbounded, which is, which is a first order assertion. So therefore we get first order theory categoricity at limits in this way. Okay, so let's talk about a little more absoluteness. So sentential categoricity is absolute to any sententially categorical cardinal, both up and down. So before we had downward absoluteness, but now we're gonna get upward absoluteness if, if the cardinal we're reflecting from is, is also sententially categorical. So, okay, suppose kappa's categorical in V lambda using sigma. So kappa is the only cardinal in V lambda so that V kappa satisfies sigma. And lambda is categorical via sentence tau. So V lambda is the only model of tau. Um, then, uh, then kappa will be categorical in V by saying sigma is true and there's no, um, and there's no inaccessible level with tau. Because of course, this is gonna be true uh, in V kappa, um, and up to lambda, kappa is the only one satisfying sigma, and above lambda, there will be something with tau. And so therefore, this combination um, uh, uh, can, can only be true in V kappa. Okay, uh, and conversely, uh, if kappa is categorical in V, then of course it's categorical inside V lambda. That's the downward absoluteness that we already observed. Okay. Also, sentential categoricity is generally not absolute at other levels. If you, if you drop these extra assumptions, then it's just not true. Okay, of course, there's eventual non-categoricity. So if kappa is, if you have a non-sententially categorical cardinal, then, then it is eventually not categorical in all sufficiently large v theta. This is, this is just easy because, of course, if, if it's not sententially categorical, that means any sentence that's true there has some other V kappa sigma where it's also true, because if there weren't such a thing, then it would have been categorical. Uh, so once you get above all those kappa sigmas, then any V theta like that can see that V kappa, that anything true in V kappa is also true somewhere else. And so therefore it won't be categorical in all, in all those thetas, that V thetas that are big enough. Okay, no Malo cardinal is first order theory categorical. Um, and that's not difficult to see because if kappa is Malo, then you can, you can find elementary substructures like this where delta is inaccessible. Yeah, I mean, there's a club of elementary substructures and because it's Malo, that club must contain an inaccessible cardinal. And so we get a smaller inaccessible with exactly the same theory. Um, and so therefore, whatever is true in V kappa is also going to be true in V, in v delta. And so it's, so it's not categorical. Okay, that's for first order theory. But the least Malo cardinal is second order categorical, second order sententially categorical, um, because being Malo is a pi 1 1 property. And so uh, that's a second order definition of being Malo, namely that every, every club in Kappa has a regular cardinal in it. That's what it means to be Malo. And, uh, and so therefore, being Malo is, a sec is second order definable and the least Malo just means that you're Malo and then you satisfy the, the first order assertion that there are no Malo cardinals uh, inside Kappa. Okay, if there are any questions, please just feel free. Okay, so that's a second order sentence that characterizes the least Malo, but no Malo cardinal, as we observed already, is first order categorical. Um, that's what the previous thing is. Okay. Could I just ask, if we're, we're assuming here that all the V kappa that we're considering are all inaccessibles, this is right? Yes, yeah, if I don't say so, then I'm probably talking about inaccessibles, so. Right, but there's, I guess there's a Because EFC2 is, 
is categorizing by the Zermelo result, categorizing the inaccessible levels. And so we're always looking at extensions of ZFC2, uh, either mm -hmm. by a sentence or by a theory. I, I guess the space under it though, for instance, you could consider like the least V kappa that, uh, well, the least worldly V kappa, so it's the unique V kappa that contains no worldly cardinals, right? Oh, I see. Yeah, if you want, let's see. Uh, I mean, being worldly is, of course, weaker than inaccessible, but it, uh, um, it, it doesn't have the quasi-categoricity result uh, in terms of the first order theory of, of ZFC, right? To be worldly just means to satisfy the first order ZFC. Right. Um, but uh, you want the second order separation axiom, I guess, to make it close under power set, because then it will be really V alpha. Mm -hmm. And that, then you'll get quasi-categoricity, right? So I guess the worldly cardinals, if we take first order ZFC plus the second order separation axiom, but not second right. order replacement, then we're going to get an analog of Zermelo's quasi-categoricity, but it's going to give us the worldly cardinals instead of the inaccessible cardinals. Mm. Yeah, cool. that's interesting. That's yeah, nice. I like that. Mm -hmm. okay. I have a question. Sure. Uh, so the, I have a question about one of the previous results, the one that said that if kappa is uh, second order sententially uh, categorical, then kappa plus is first order sententially categorical yes this one yeah uh, uh, please tell me maybe maybe it's it's trivial if we replace second order sententially into second order theory why it doesn't generalize why why wouldn't kappa plus also be able to first order characterize satisfaction of well, an entire the, it, the theory uh might not be describable in a sentence up at v kappa plus so you might not be able to say in a single sentence that the, the largest inaccessible cardinal satisfies such and such a theory, right? So if you replace them both with theories, then, uh, then you're good. Oh, yeah. Right. But if, if you only replace this one with a theory and you still want first order sentential categoricity at the successor, then I don't see how that's going to work. And you kind of code it some, somehow into... Yeah, if you allow parameters or something, then you could do it because the theory mm -hmm. would be a parameter. Yeah. Okay. So sententially categorical with parameters, with real parameters. Yeah. The theory. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, let's see. So where are we here? Um, okay, so we can weaken that Malo hypothesis because, uh, well, for example, we could we could talk about uplifting. So this is a notion that Tom Johnson and I introduced. So kappa is uplifting if there are arbitrarily large lambda where v kappa is elementary and v lambda. Um, so this is of course already violating categoricity. If you have an, even a single instance of this, then neither one of those cardinals can be theory categorical, first order theory categorical. But it's already much weaker than Malo and you only need one instance of it. Uh, which is, of course, much weaker still. But in fact, you don't even need that. You only need elementary equivalence because we're talking about the theory without parameters when we're talking about categoricity. And we really only need elementary equivalence here in order to get non-categoricity for these cardinals. Okay, let me tell you a little bit about the rank elementary forest. So I'm going to put a relation on, on inaccessible cardinals. So kappa precedes lambda if, uh, if the rank initial segments are elementary. So that's a perfectly good order. So that the, the chains in that order are exactly the elementary chains on the rank initial segment. And that's a tree order or a forest order, I should say, because the predecessors of any node are linearly ordered. There might not be a unique root. You know? So it's not a tree because it might be disconnected. Um, but it's, uh, it's a forest, and the, the categorical cardinals are exactly the stumps. I'm sorry, they are stumps. They're not exactly the stumps, but they are stumps in the rank elementary forest. So what's a stump in a forest? Well, it's a node that, isn't, that doesn't have anything above it or below it. It's an isolated node in that forest. That's what categoricity is about. It's about, uh, it's about being a stump in, in that forest. 
um, but not exactly because the, this order is about elementary submodel, but the categoricity is really just about having the same theory, which is a, a weaker. Thing. So you could define a version of this that they have the same theory, which is a weakening. Um, and then they would be exactly the stumps. Okay, uh, right. So let's talk about gaps now. We already observed that if there is an omega one inaccessible cardinal, then it will be sententially categorical, but not every inaccessible cardinal below it will be because there can be only countably many. Um, but this theorem is a slight improvement on that. We don't need there to be an omega one inaccessible. We only need there to, to be uncountably many, but there might not be one on top of those. And so if there are uncountably many inaccessible cardinals, then there will still be gaps in the sententially categorical cardinals. So let's assume there's uncountably many. So, so therefore, not all of them are sententially categorical because there's only countably many sentences. Um, uh, and uh, so let's fix kappa inaccessible, which is not categorical, not sententially categorical. Um, and any sufficiently large V theta can see this. I want to fix kappa, say, amongst the first omega one many, I guess. So any larger V theta can see that it's not sententially categorical. Because what does it mean to be not categorical? It means that any sentence true there um, uh, uh, is also true somewhere else. So once V theta has those other ones, then it can see that. Uh, so let theta be the smallest inaccessible cardinal that thinks that there is an inaccessible cardinal that is not sententially categorical, and there will be such a theta. Um, and um, uh, uh, and that is a characterization of V theta. It's the smallest one that thinks that there is a non-sententially categorical cardinal. Uh, that's a characterization of the least such theta. Uh, so therefore, there must be gaps. Okay, so what do I mean by gaps? Ga a gap in the set, I mean that there are a bunch of sententially categorical cardinals, the least one and the first, you know, omega one CK, many, they're all categorical. But then eventually there's some non-categorical ones and then larger ones that are categorical again. So there's sort of holes in the categorical cardinal. Okay, let's get some more gaps with the, this, exactly the same argument is gonna work with second order sentential categoricity. But let's do it with theory categoricity. Okay, so let's assume a lot of inaccessible cardinals. Um, I guess I need continuum plus many. Uh, then there's going to be a first order sententially categorical cardinal, which is larger than some cardinal which is not categorical in any way, either by sentences or theories or first or second order. So basically, I'm saying it's not second order theory categorical. Okay, so assume that there's at least C plus many inaccessibles. So there's, well, how many theories are there? There's only continuum many theories. So, so therefore, uh, there must be some, some of these inaccessibles. There's too many inaccessibles for them all to have different theories. So therefore, there must be some that are not second order theory categorical. So there's some theta that can see that. Um, and let theta be the least one, and then that property itself is a first order property about B theta uh, that characterizes. Okay, let's talk about the number of categorical cardinals. We've already said there's only countably many sententially categorical cardinals because there's only countably many sentences. Um, so therefore, but also, if there are infinitely many inaccessible cardinals, then there will be uh, uh, countably many sententially categorical cardinals. Um, because we've already observed that the first omega many inaccessible cardinals are always sententially categorical, and much more, the first omega one CK many, if they exist. Um, okay, what about theory categorical cardinals? Well, there's at most continuum many theory categorical cardinals, either first or second order, because that's the, the number of theories. Uh, so how many theory categorical cardinals must there be? Uh, and in particular, if you have a lot of inaccessible, say continuum many, then do you have to have that many theory categorical cardinals? That would be the analog of the sentential categoricity. 
result. Whenever you have at least omega many inaccessibles, then you have at, at least omega many yeah. sententially categorical one. And this question here is asking, is the same kind of thing true about the theory categorical cardinals? Or for example, if there's uncountably many inaccessibles, then do you have to have uncountably many theory categorical cardinals? Um, or in particular, do the first omega one many inaccessible cardinals have to always be theory categorical? Okay, so let's answer some of these. All the answers are no, by the way. Oh, I'm sorry, this isn't a yes or no question. Uh, but the other answers are all no. So let's let's prove that. Uh, let me just see the line of time here. Oh, I see plenty of time. We go for 90 minutes, is that right, or what? Usually we do like an hour, 15, hour 20 with questions, hour 30, or something oh, like I that. Oh, I see, now. okay, that's fine. So, uh, Okay, so it, I claim it's relatively consistent that the, there's a proper class of inaccessible cardinals, but only countably many theory categorical cardinals. So that's a strong negative to the kind of questions that we were just asking. So assume there's a proper class of inaccessible cardinals, and then go to a forcing extension where you've collapsed the continuum to omega. Now that forcing is small relative to any of the inaccessible cardinals, so it doesn't create or destroy any inaccessible cardinals. Um, and, uh, and furthermore, the forcing is definable and homogeneous, and therefore it cannot create any categorical cardinal because it can't be that some cardinal has some property in the extension because that property would have to be forced, uh, but because it's homogeneous, the Boolean value of that property uh, would would be one, and therefore the statement that the, that definable forcing gives value one to that thing would be a characterization of that cardinal in the ground model. Uh, so, uh, so therefore the forcing cannot create any categorical cardinals. And since it was originally at most continuum, many of the cardinals were categorical, uh, now there's only countably many because we collapsed that cardinal to be countable. So in the forcing extension, there's only countably many categorical cardinals. Okay. Sorry, do you need a proper class of inaccessibles there? Or no, you just need no, like you B don't. plus or something? Yeah, I think that's right, yeah. So it just makes a stronger counter example though, in a sense, because it's saying, look, even if, I mean, that this theorem would work for any sufficiently large number here, but in terms of providing a counterexample to the principle that if right. you're not allowed, yeah, then it's it's sort of stronger to have many of them. I mean, but in a way, I think if you don't have to assume anything about how many inaccessibles you have, you can just say any model has a forcing extension in which there are at most countably many categorical yeah. cardinals. But but that theorem has a much easier proof, which is just kill all the inaccessibles. Okay, so there is an inaccessibility <laughs> preserving forcing. <laughs> right, okay, yeah. yeah. So yeah, absolutely, yeah. Right. Or a small forcing extension, yeah. Okay, so just collapsing the continuum to be countable always makes there at most be countably many uh, theory categorical cardinals, right. Okay, let's see. So here's another one. If we have at least continuum many inaccessibles, then there's a forcing extension where we preserve the continuum and we have exactly the same inaccessibles um, in which the first continuum many inaccessible cardinals are all first order theory categorical. So I can make them all categorical, the first continuum many. Okay, it's kind of a dual version. Before I was, I was making there be few theory categorical. Now I'm making there be a lot of theory categorical cardinals. I'm going to create new categorical cardinals. Okay, so this is how it goes. So let's call kappa alpha the alpha th inaccessible, um, and then enumerate all the subsets of omega in order type continuum. And now think about kappa alpha. Well, of course, among for alpha less than continuum, kappa alpha it's a it's a um, scattered set. N none of them are uh, limits of the smaller ones, because alpha is way less than than kappa zero even, right? But these are regular cardinals. So therefore, every given kappa alpha, the soup of the inaccessibles is strictly below it. And now I'm going to code a alpha into the GCH pattern 
above the soup of the inaccessibles below kappa alpha. So I have kappa alpha for alpha less than C. That's an inaccessible cardinal, but there's some, there's only alpha many smaller inaccessibles. Those are bounded. I code the GCH pattern uh, above that soup. So kappa alpha can say, what's the, so the soup of inaccessibles is definable and it can recover that, the GCH coding in the forcing extension, it will be definable. So A alpha becomes definable uh, in the theory of V kappa alpha, namely for each, for each natural number n, V kappa alpha can say, well, does the GCH hold at the nth regular cardinal above the soup of the inaccessibles or not? And that's a statement in the theory for each n. And so the theory as a whole um, is going to code A alpha. So that all the kappa alphas will have different theories. And furthermore, uh, for any given one of them, V kappa alpha is going to be the first time that it has its pattern happening in that way. And therefore, that will distinguish that, uh, uh, that V kappa alpha from all the other ones. So they, so they each become theory categorical in the forcing extension. Um, and if you have the GCH in the original ground model, then this forcing preserves all cardinals and cofinalities because we're just doing GCH coding. So it's just Easton, uh, Easton product forcing to do that coding. Um, because we have the enumeration of the reals in advance. Um, and so, uh, so we're preserving all the cardinals and cofinalities, we're preserving all the inaccessibles, and we're making all of those first continuum many inaccessible cardinals theory categorical. Okay. So we can also arrange an intermediate number because we said, well, look, there's at most continuum many. And so far we've got, well, there could be only countably many. And then we said, well, there could be continuum many. And so the question is, well, what if CH fails? Can you make it in between omega and, and the continuum? And the answer is yes. So it's relatively consistent that the, the number of, of theory categorical cardinals is omega one, even when CH fails and there's a proper class of inaccessibles. Okay, so, well, you can just start with the model of CH and we can do that coding of the reals into the GCH pattern uh, just below each of the inaccessibles for the first omega one many. And then we can make the continuum big after that, not bigger than any of the kappa alphas, but make it omega three or something. Um, and then uh, that will preserve all that GCH coding, provided we don't overlap with it. Uh, and it will preserve all the inaccessibles. And so we're gonna have at least omega one many inaccessibles, but in fact, we're gonna have exact, I mean, inaccessibles that are theory categorical because we did the coding to make them theory categorical. But we're gonna have exactly omega one many because this extra forcing here is homogeneous and definable. So it can't create any new instances of categoricity. Uh, and therefore in the forcing extension, we'll have exactly omega one many, even though the continuum is big. Quick question. Sure. On that previous slide, does the argument generalize if you want to have, say, like omega two many first order theory categorical? Yeah, it's first exactly order. what's here. Uh, we could have had L of seventeen many, and the continuum be this, or it's completely flexible. You can make it exactly anything you want. So very good. Um, as long as it's definable, right? You you use that yes, uh, forcing yes. is definable. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. It has to be definable. The forcing has to be not only homogeneous but definable in order that we can refer to the boolean value in a sentence. Exactly. Okay. So here is the implication diagram that Roman had asked about. Okay. Um, so. Uh, okay, so that's the second order theory categorical, second order sententially categorical, first order theory categorical, first order sententially categorical. So the claim is that none of these implications are reversible. So this is the complete diagram uh, and no other implications are provable. I mean, of course, I mean the transitive closure. So this one implies this, one, <laughs> of course. Uh, okay, so first of all, all of these positive implications are easy. I mean, it's immediate. Uh, and now I want to ask the graduate students or the recent graduate students uh, how, in order to show that none of these arrows is reversible, how many 
counterexample situations do you need to provide? Of course, four is an upper bound because in order to show this one isn't reversible, you need to provide something that satisfies this, but not that. And to show this one isn't reversible, you need to provide something that satisfies this, but not that, and so on for the other. So, so with four, we can definitely do it, uh, but can we get by with less? Just one, right? One? What do you mean? Which one? What is, what is your counterexample going to be like? It's going to have a situation in which you, uh, um, anything that's, well, there's something that's second order categorical that's not. Uh, you mean sentential? First order. Or? Um, wait, 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 wait. No, I got it wrong. <laughs> Someone else okay. go. <laughs> okay, any volunteers? Is it three? Okay, so who's saying three? Oh, Cameron's saying but, two. I, Corey is saying three, but oh, maybe okay. Cameron's right. Cameron, what, is, what are your two? Just have one that's the bottom layer, but not the middle, one that's the middle two, but not the top. Oh, you want the union of these. Oh, I see. Uh, if something that's both of those in the middle, but not the top, that gives you a counterexample to two arrows. Well, couldn't there be arrows across here? Oh, I see. Wait, so you, in that you case, think you can have two because you could have one that, on the one hand, you could have one that's uh, second order categorical and, and therefore first order categorical, but not first order theory categorical and one that's first order theory categorical and first order sententially yeah. categorical, but not second order sententially categorical. I mean, so Corey, if you show that I, your non-implications in the middle, then you've shown the whole thing, so it's two, I see. I, I think it's two, but not the way Cameron described it. I'm not sure that works because Cameron, I don't know how you rule out arrows across the middle with your way. So you're cutting it diagonally then? Yeah, so that's, I'm that's saying, what I'm saying two is sufficient because all you need to do is show there's no arrow from here to there and there's no arrow from here to there because then these two can't be the same because then there would be an arrow from here to there because if this one reversed, it would also combine with this to make an arrow across. So you really only need to re refute the arrows across here and that's sufficient to show the whole diagram is complete. Um, okay, I, I find that kind of thing really confusing actually. Uh, I remember, Gunter, do you remember this paper that we wrote on degrees? It was this very similar thing. We had six things in this diagram and, and we had to really think, well, what do we need to do really to show the diagram is complete? And I don't know why that kind of simple thing is so irritating to think about. Uh, but okay, in this case, we only need two. We just need to show there's no arrows across the center here in either direction. And that will show that none of those arrows reverse. Okay. So let's do it. There's the diagram again, same diagram. So we need a second order sententially categorical that's not first order theory categorical. So that's gonna show that we don't have an arrow from here to there. Um, and we need a first order theory categorical over here that's not second order sententially categorical. That will show there's no arrow the other way. And from that, you can deduce that none of the arrows is uh, reversing. Now for the first one, we already did it in fact, because the least malo cardinal is, second order sententially categorical, but not first order theory categorical, which we already talked about. And so that's showing that, okay, assuming consistency of Malo, but actually you can get away, as we said, with much less than Malo um, in order to know, you have to make some kind of assumption about consistency because of course, if, if it's inconsistent that there's more than omega many inaccessibles, then the whole diagram collapses to one point, I think, in that case, because I think I'll be the same. Um, okay, so you need some consistency assumptions anyways in order for the diagram to be separated. And if you give me a malo, that's enough, but actually much less like uplifting and so on, these much weaker things are sufficient. Okay, so now for the other one, let's do it. I claim if there's uncountably many inaccessible cardinals, then the first inaccessible cardinal that is above all of the second order sententially categorical cardinals is first order theory categorical, but not sententially categorical. <laughs> okay, so, all right, let's prove that. Um, okay, I claim this is just an instance of the limit theorem that we discussed in the beginning. 
uh, sort of tied in knot. Okay, so let's see. So we're looking at the first inaccessible that's above all the second order sententially categorical cardinals. So this model can see all those and see all those second order sentences that, that characterize those cardinals. So it's part of the theory of this model that all those cardinals exist. Yeah. Um, okay, let's see. So it's part of the theory of that cardinal that all the smaller sententially categorical cardinals exist, the ones that do. Um, uh, and that there are no inaccessible cardinals above all of them that are second order of, of I mean, sorry, there are no inaccessible cardinals above all the second order sententially categorical cardinals um, because there aren't any. Uh, and so only V Kappa thinks that exactly those sententially categorical cardinals exist with nothing above. So that is part of the theory uh, of V kappa, so it'll make it first order theory categorical, but if it can't be sententially categorical because it's bigger than all of the sententially categorical. So that separates the other direction. Let me just mention that it follows that if you have enough inaccessible cardinals, then the soup of the theory categorical cardinals always stretches higher, strictly higher than the supremum of the sententially categorical. Okay, let me come now to these final two philosophical points and uh, I won't be going much longer. Um, okay, so, so far we've been using what I would call an internal account of categoricity because we defined categorical cardinal, we defined it in ZFC, sort of internally, it's a first order definable notion like one would define any large cardinal notion. Um, and that is different from giving a kind of meta-theoretic account of categoricity and just to see the difference suppose you had a model of zfc a non-standard model that had a non-standard n a non-standard finite n now we prove that the first omega many inaccessibles are always sententially categorical because the kth one thinks that there are exactly k inaccessibles below um, uh, if we start indexing with zero uh, you know, but if K is non-standard, then, uh, then that's not actually a sentence in the meta theory. It's, it's a non-standard sentence, the Kth one. You can't write a sentence down saying the Kth one if K is a non-standard number. And so, so the question here is, uh, are we doing categoricity the right way or not? Because part of what we wanna do with categoricity is provide theories that uniquely characterize our mathematical structures. And so we want to actually be able to write those theories down. And that seems to be an activity that would take place in the meta theory rather than in the object theory. And so the question is, is, is categoricity really, a, should it be a meta theoretic claim or should it be an object theoretic claim? And are we doing it wrong or not? I don't think we're doing it wrong because I think that even say the Dedekind and the Huntington categoricity results about the natural numbers and the reals are really taking place in a set theoretic background. I mean, different models of CFC all think that Dedekind's categoricity result is correct, even when they have different non-isomorphic models of omega. I mean, if one of them I mean, is- uh, The problem would be how would you interpret the second order uh, theories if you work in the meta theory, right? I mean- Right, but we're claiming I, that something is categorical, but we actually can't write the theory down. I know, yeah. But on the other hand, I mean, uh, like if you don't place yourself inside a ZFC model, then it becomes difficult to interpret the second order quantifiers. Right, I, I completely agree, but not everyone agrees with that. And they think that second order logic has a kind of absolute meaning or something that uh, like Kreisel argues this and so on, that, that the continuum hypothesis is settled determinately uh, uh, in second order logic. Okay, I view it as saying, well, look, it's, it's settled. You're like once you fix the set theoretic background that's determining the meaning of the second order logic. Okay, but if you have the view that second order logic is really a kind of logic and not a kind of set theory, then you might be tempted by this. So I think we're doing it right. So I agree with your comments, Spencer. And, uh, can, they, and I think, can, they, can they say which way it is settled or? No, 
Of course not. <laughs> no, I mean, of course, it's sort of, I, I've argued that uh, it's sort of like saying um, uh, the, the time and location of your death is completely determinate. It's determined because, uh, well, like when you actually die, it'll be in a particular time and place. <laughs> and so, you know, it's determined. Uh, because whatever happens, it will happen at a particular time and place. That's the sense in which Kreisel is arguing that second order logic determines the outcome of CH because once you fix the set theoretic background, then there's an answer to CH in that set theoretic background. Of course, a different background might have a different answer. And so that's a way of maybe saying that that argument isn't so satisfactory. Uh, so that would lead you to this internal analysis of categoricity of the kind that we mounted here. Um, but I think, yeah, it's definitely something to think about. I mean, I'm not completely clear on how to think about this uh, this issue. Okay, let me mention another issue which was already came up, and that's the tension between categoricity and reflection that Gunther had already mentioned. Um, namely, well, there's a sweeping attitude in mathematics uh, uh, about categoricity being an extremely positive feature of our uh, mathematical structures, like the natural numbers and the real numbers and the complex numbers. It's precisely because we have categorical accounts of them that we think that we know what we're talking about when we say the natural numbers are the reals. The reals are a complete order field and they're all isomorphic and so therefore this has unique meaning and so on. You can find many, many mathematicians talking like that. And so it seems to be that categoricity is a very positive feature. But, uh, right, okay, so we know these structures because of the categorical account. But in set theory, we also have this idea of reflection, uh, that namely that we expect the set theoretic universe to, to exhibit reflection. So anything true is reflecting down to some level. And the point I wanna make is that that is exactly anti-categorical, right? It's an, reflection is a highly anti-categorical phenomenon because it's exactly saying anything that's true is already true, you know, quite often along the way, right? And so why is it that we like categoricity so much for the natural numbers and the reals, but we don't want it for the cumulative hierarchy? Um, so set theorists don't want V to have, a, we don't want to live in the, in one of those categorical theories like ZFC2 plus there is no inaccessible or there are only omega plus 10 inaccessibles or something. Nobody wants to live in those, uh, with those theories. Those are the categorical theories. Um, so we want reflection to be happening. And so isn't there a tension between those two attitudes? And I think that's a real puzzle that uh, needs to be thought about. Um, okay, that's it. Thank you very much. Let's, let's thank the speaker. Or you can do the clap emoji. Moji, thanks so much. Sure. Um, um, are there any... Yes, go ahead. Um, on your... Um, I can't claim to have followed much of that, I'm sorry. Um, but on, on the implication uh, slide, um, there are two more questions you could ask, which are, um, is it possible to be on the bottom layer, but... Um, oh, hold on. Yeah, is it possible to be in the bottom layer, but not, but in neither of the two middle ones, like not in their right. union? That's true, yes. And also, is it possible to be in the intersection of the two middle ones and not in the top one? Yeah, I think you're right about that. So uh, I think, yeah, maybe we should, we should, I think both of those are right. I mean, I think it's going to be true, uh, but we don't have it in the paper. Maybe we should put that in. So we really need four, you're saying, to really uh, settle the... Yeah, to, to, to fill in the... Uh, I mean, diagram. it's not just about the, the, the single implications, but you're talking about the sort of joint implications that one might express using any of those concepts, which collections might imply others. Um, and so uh, right, I think right. both I think of those are going to be right. It's like a Venn diagram, a small circle inside it, and a big circle outside right. of that. And yeah. that gives you four re How many regions does that give you? That gives you a bunch of regions. Yeah, I think you're right. Maybe the Venn diagram way of of expressing it, it would make it clear actually instead of just a, an implication diagram you know because we want to show there's there's things in every cell then
except for the obvious inclusions that come from the implications. Right. Um, Joel, I mean, you have for this, for the inaccessible cardinals, obviously, you have this kind of semantic characterization due to Cermelo, and then also, of course, the normal combinatorial characterization that everybody knows. For the anti categorical cardinals, is it, can you give a kind of combinatorial characterization, say those are the inaccessibles such that they have such and such property? Oh, I see. Uh, oh, that's an interesting question. Um, I mean, it would seem pretty hard to come up with one because the definition of categoricity is all right. about what's true in them. And so it seems like you're gonna be forced to talk about that theory. Uh, so I would be very hard pressed to find some other way of saying- I mean, it, I guess it would have to be some sort of almost meta theoretic thing. Cause you, you can, obviously if it's a first order definable thing, then the first one like that would be categorical. Right. But if you say, you know, it's a limit of a, it's a, you know, a limit of inaccessibles which all have a certain property and it has a two. I mean, you could sort of fake it, like, you know, talk about the girdle operations and so on, and then use the, those things as kind of proxies for the formulas, right? And, and but that's cheating, right? So, uh, um, yeah, I don't, I don't know the answer. Are there any other questions? Oh, Neil, go ahead. Thanks, so, um, I guess I'm going to try and have a go at one of these uh, philosophical uh, points at the end okay. there. And so, I mean, something that, <clears throat> for instance, um, Dan Isaacson has proposed is the idea that when I provide, a, I mean, a lot of people wouldn't want to have this, but providing a categorical characterization in some sense determines a structure. He's almost got like a it's almost like an idealistic uh, a kind of idea, uh, constructivism type view, but not quite. So, I mean, maybe the answer or one of the answers you might give to your question towards the end is why do we want categoricity? Because then we have determined a particular structure in that case. Right. right. Uh, so, we've, you know, we know we can refer in a very particular way. But the general practice of set theory is one where we want to study like these more uh, kind of algebraic relationships between universes, let's say. So maybe it's a question of determining individual subject matters versus talking algebraic here, and these can sort of happily coexist with one another. But how is that going to lead you to the whether it should be the internal or the external point of view? I mean. Uh... Is that oh, sorry. This so so. This isn't. Uh, maybe I misunderstood. This isn't a point about the internal versus the external. It's more about um, why is categoricity versus reflection desirable. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. So I know that um, Dan Isaacson sorry. is very much in favor of. I mean, it, it looks very fondly on this Kressel argument, and you know the fact that all the V Kappas agree on the CH question mm. is sort of part of the picture there uh so um yeah i mean I when, uh, when can, can i say something about the uh, i mean about this issue like the categoricity versus reflection i mean to me you know say if you work in the you assume there is a there are undoubtedly many inaccessibles saying that there are non-categorical ones implies that if you cut off uh, the universe at some earlier stage you will have uh, categorical ones, you know. I mean, so so it's like uh, the existence of non -ref uh, of reflecting uh, large cardinals implies that below you have uh, you know categorical ones, and so in a way, I think it's more it's less limiting and more including inclusive. Like you don't uh, right. It's it's about not being restrictive. I don't understand I it because say. there are always categorical ones. The least one is always categorical and the next one. Yeah, as long as you have, as you have, like, you have to have an inaccessible, of course, in order to have a categorical one, right? But then maybe you want a, uh, an inaccessible that not only is inaccessible, but even, uh, you know, a limit of inaccessibles. Okay, for that, you need some, some more, right? But uh, I, I just think, you know, uh, saying that you have stronger and stronger instances of reflection is kind of 
not as limiting as saying that, you know, for example, you would like to, if you want to have a universe where every inaccessible is uh, categorical, then that's very limiting uh, when it comes to the existence, right. you know, what is out there. Oh, that's yeah, kind of so I mean, people talk about maximize and so on, and this is leading towards reflection. But the the question that I have is, uh, why do we find those appealing when they are anti-categorical, whereas we find categoricity in all other domains of mathematics very appealing? So uh, can I can I say why? I, well, the, can I say why I think that, that that's true? Because I mean, in set theory, we have forcing. So like. Like if you have a plane, you want to maybe travel a lot because you can, you know, so for us, we prefer flexibility because <laughs> we have forcing. They don't have force. They don't have that tool. So what, if, you, if you don't have that tool, then you definitely don't want to, I would think you don't, you want categoricity is a much, much nicer place to be. But for us, we have forcing. So we want to go places, you know, we want it, we want it, we don't want category. I see. That's very interesting. Although, I mean, I think people expressed uh, reflection ideas even before the independence phenomenon was firmly established. And so it can't be the real reason that we find it appealing. Um, but I mean, of course, from my own perspective, I really, <laughs> I look very favorably on that <laughs> idea of going to these other models, other, other universes. Yeah. Um, it seems like people like the um, real numbers to be not just categorical, but they also want it like it to have no automorphisms, which uh, the field of real, real, real numbers does not have any automorphisms. Sure, but the complex numbers have a categorical characterization, but they have many, many automorphisms, right? So, But if you include a complex conjugation, then they don't have those automorphisms. Sure, yeah. I guess, though, every V kappa is rigid. I mean, and also V is rigid. So uh, transitive sets are always rigid. So. So I'm not sure this rigidity is really explaining the difference. Um, uh, Joel, just a small comment about this. Because I, un I understand that there is this high respect for categoricity, but when it's restricted to first order, because then, you know, being kappa categorical for particular kappa carries with it all kinds of consequences on the structure theory of the structure. Or on or more this theory, the transfer of categoricity. Once you know you're not, you know you're kappa categorical for some uncountable cardinal, you're kappa categorical for all of them. So there is some kind of deep analysis of the structure that depends on categoricity. So, but here, what do you learn about the object itself once you discover that it's either categorical or not? This is sort of there are different kind of questions because you have all those other kind of logics for which you get your categoricity. So maybe this is something for the future. Yeah, that yeah, makes a lot the, of the, sense the, the, to me. Although I guess I would respond by saying, I mean, the notion of kappa categoricity, the way I think about it is, look, we only talk about kappa categoricity in first order logic because we can't ever have actual categoricity because of the, because of the level uh, well, theorem. No, no, but so it's it, a but kind but of but proxy. No. No, no right. that, that, that is true to some extent, but if you read what uh, John Baldwin is writing recently, uh, that you know that there is something much more mysterious about that. That you know that there are some considerations about uncountable structures and this transfer of categoricity, and they want to replica replicate this for abstract elementary classes. That you know that there is something that is titled from the number of structures to the structure of numbers. Right. That from those very general model theoretic considerations, suddenly you get some kind of insight into what your structure really looks like because you don't really know what it looks like. You know, so it's not a, it's not a big right. accomplishment to categorize natural numbers in the sense because we know what they look like. You don't learn anything from the categoricity in this or the kind of logic other than the fact that it is categorical. So it's a different kind of consideration. But you know, there is yeah. this mystique in sort of first order uh, model theory that sort of there is much beyond what you get, you know, from rather than the result itself. Well, certainly there's you know extremely deep work. Uh, you know, the kind of stuff you're talking about is extremely deep work in, in model theory. Right. But I mean, on the other hand, if you talk to sort of ordinary mathematicians who are not in logic, then they know about categoricity, about the categorical accounts of the real numbers and the complex numbers and the natural numbers maybe even. Um, and, and, they, and they wouldn't be able to tell you what kappa categoricity is about. 
right? And but well, they, but they do think this other kind of categorization is extremely important for their understanding and for the reference even of what. Well, so so maybe they're wrong. Maybe they're wrong. Yeah, probably. <laughs> you know, people who don't know logic are wrong. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, in first order, if you're categorical in some power, then in particular the theory is complete. And obviously that's something that every mathematician likes because that means that there's a proof from some set of axioms that people I think have an idea of. And of course in second order, like these theories are not complete. ZF2 is not complete in a proof theoretic sense by exactly these arguments that you've been talking about, right? So I think that the, se the second order categoricity is maybe less interesting in that context because it doesn't actually tell us anything about the theory. I see, that's quite interesting. And that just to that, that seems like a lot of, you know, John Baldwin's points as Roman was raising is, you know, for instance, if you're uncountably categorical, you have like a decent notion of dimension for building up the models in a ad algebraic closure type way, which seems to be something that the model theorists are very interested in. I have a question about the mathematics, if everyone's... Sure. Fine to move on. This uh, follow up to a question Neil asked during the talk. <clears throat> so it seems like the only use of second order ZF here was to get that you're looking at inaccessible cardinals. And then once we had that, the rest of the talk seemed to just talk about inaccessible cardinals and the second order ZF didn't really come up. And so That's it right. seems like you could make the same analysis with any sort of large cardinal notion, or large cardinal might even be something that ZF proves exists. Yeah, I so think that's totally something right. something that you could, like, I guess, have you looked at this? Do you get the same answer? Does it differ? It seems like a lot of the work. I think a lot over. of the arguments are just going to generalize straight away, like gaps and all that. It's really just about, so it should be a first order expressible notion, right? Sure. So a bigger one should be able to tell whether the smaller one is having the property or not. So you couldn't use super compact or something, it wouldn't work, but measurable cardinal or, you know, locally strong, partially super compact, something like that. Uh, I think a lot of the arguments would just go straight through with that strategy um, uh, because you're absolutely right. We didn't really use anything except there was some definable class of cardinals, locally definable class. So I guess we're talking, you know, delta two uh, uh, class of, of large cardinals. And then you're looking at categoricity with respect to that class of cardinals. Um, and uh, yeah, that's a, that's a very insightful observation, I think. Mm -hmm. Are there any more questions? In that case, let's thank the speaker again. Joel, thank you so much. It's always thank you so much for having me. It was a pleasure. It's so nice to see all of you again.